Hello everyone, um, I'm going to record this little video lecture to uh, finish up our treatment of Plato's Republic Book 2 and this sort of discussion about the value of justice and morality um, and in the face of some kinds of obstacles and dangers to um, its rationality. So this is again continuing the discussion of uh, that we've been having in class about why be moral, like what's the point of it. And in the class session that we had this week, from Wednesday, um, we talked about sort of the big backdrop for this conversation, and we got through as far as Glaucon's first argument for why justice should be in this third class of good, which again is uh, to say that it's something that is valuable, but only for what you're getting out of it, and not sort of intrinsically for itself. So. Um, Again, Glaucon is playing a devil's advocate sort of position here, so he doesn't really believe this. But he's defending it because um, he wants to see a better answer out of Socrates for why um, justice really ought to be praised for itself. And if it's intrinsically valuable, then our commitment to it is, is much greater. It's not contingent on whether it's working for us, basically. I mean, the kinds of goods that come from justice... Um, don't have to do with justice itself, but are sort of, we might say, um, mm, ulterior motives that would get us to act justly. Just like someone doing something nice for somebody else just as a manipulative gesture, or like, say, a, a corporation doing some kind of charity drive just to create good PR or something like that. Um, actually, I'm kind of in an awkward position with this camera, so let me fix that. All right, that's a little bit better. Okay. So let's get into the second argument. Now, I was saying at the end of class on Wednesday that this first argument is not so great. And I gave an example of why. Um, how the first argument about the origin of justice, like why would we have created uh, morality in the first place, um, is not that great because it's identifying a motive about sort of the origin of something. But just because something starts out that way doesn't mean that sort of exhausts everything about it, including the sort of reasons for why we might continue to do it, um, or what other sort of opportunities for value are out there. And I use that example from Fiddler on the Roof about the couple who has an arranged marriage, so they didn't marry each other for love, but then love came into the relationship later on. Um, and this isn't anything about evaluating arranged marriages or something like that, but just as a demonstration of how things can change and how the value in something or the reasons we have for valuing it can also evolve. And they're not stuck with whatever was the initial basis for engaging with it. And I think that's the, definitely the reply that can be made here to this kind of objection. But as we're going to see, the arguments are going to get better. They're going to get a little stronger. And I want to again foreshadow something I'm going to talk about a lot more toward the end of the lecture about why Plato is sort of doing it this way. Why is he presenting the debate in this fashion? Why through a devil's advocate? Why these particular arguments? And one of my suspicions is that Plato doesn't think they're completely false. The points that get brought up in these arguments, I don't think Plato thinks of as entirely illegitimate. They reveal something that's important about um, our relationship with morality as a part of going through this. So um, more on that as we go a little further. But let's let's get the rest of Glaucon's arguments down. Okay, the next big one is this Ring of Gyges thought experiment. Um, and I'm not going to recast the whole thing here. You've read the reading, so you know the basic story of this uh, shepherd who finds this ring that gives him the power to be invisible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the way in which Glaucon's trying to use this thought experiment or this story um, is to show that everyone who does actually live a moral life, as he puts it, do, they do this against their will. A bunch of you asked about this in the reading comments about what does that even mean. And the basic idea is that if justice really only has value for what you get out of it, then you don't choose it for its own sake. Um, and if you could do without it, you would, right? You just pursue the things that you actually value directly. Um, but maybe um, morality is one of these sorts of things that gets you what you want, but you don't have any like deeper commitment to it. Just like with this way in which uh, agreeing to a system of moral living is going to get you some kind of practical benefit, like this protection against other people screwing with you when you don't have the power to deter them or to retaliate. 
Um, so a similar thing here. So um, what the thought experiment is supposed to show is that if you had the power where you didn't have to deal with morality as your vehicle of getting what you want, then you wouldn't com commit to it any further. And that's evidence. This thought experiment is a way to kind of show that people don't really care about morality for its own sake. And before we get into the details of it, just let's just grant for the sake of argument that that argument succeeds, okay? Um, that still wouldn't be a very good argument in defense of the thesis here, because just like with the first argument, Glaucon's second argument here is just saying people have these motives, so that shows you what's actually valuable here. And that can't be enough, right? Even if all humans, like even if no humans valued justice for its own sake, if they all practice justice against their will, like not, it's not their first choice, um, that they're sort of pra pragmatically or practically led into it, that still wouldn't justify that justice doesn't have intrinsic value. Uh, it just means people are don't see it or are not responsive to it, right? Um, just because someone's like, well, I don't like it, doesn't mean it doesn't actually have value, right? Um, even if, it, if that value is not being respected, it may not take it away if we're thinking about value in a kind of objective sense. Okay. Mm. To kind of put this in... Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is maybe this is a little bit of a hot take, but it is a good example of what I'm talking about and what Glaucon's thought, what's going on with Glaucon's argument. Let's say, um, so let's let's assume some things for the sake of argument. Uh, one of them I don't think takes much of an assumption here, but that uh, forces of global warming and climate change are real, and they're the result of human action and activity, and they're going to have terrible, terrible consequences. So doing things like um, reform to our economic systems about our way of life, trying to take these efforts to repair the environment to the, the extent that we can, is a valuable thing to do because of those sorts of facts of what's happening. Um, and that's true even if no one believes in it or no one treats it as a, as a high priority. It would still have that kind of value. Um, even if no one believes that drinking antifreeze is a bad idea, it still is a bad idea, <laughs> right? The, and that's just on the level of practical values. That's just on the level of things being good or bad um, that don't even involve sort of these higher moral issues. Even the sorts of stuff that Glaucon, the position that Glaucon's defending, what they're thinking about as valuable, like the Trasimachus view about power being valuable, even that is an objective claim. Um, and they'd have to admit of the possibility of being wrong about that. Okay, so just because people do have these motives, that human character maybe is shaped in this sort of way, is not proof of itself about what thing, what objective value stuff has. And that's the that's the crucial bottom line here for why this argument is not super effective either. But let's take a look at it. So um, it still maybe reveals something about us. So. Glaucon says, okay, you're all familiar with this myth of the Ring of Gyges. Okay, imagine there's two rings. So we got two rings, right? And we're going to give one ring to a person who is an, an unjust person. Uh, they already do unjust things. Well, what are they going to do with the ring? Well, the ring makes them invisible. And the big thing, the power that that gives them is the ability to evade consequences. And that's the whole point of this. I mean, you could cook up whatever kind of science fiction thing you want to or magical situation that you want to um, in order to get that result. That's the key thing that works for the situation here. So they've got the power to evade punishment. They can basically do whatever they want without any consequences at all. That's the power that the Ring of Gyges confers onto somebody. So if you give that to the ju the unjust person, what are they going to do? They're going to use their power to do even greater unjust things, right? Um, but here's the big thing. that That's no surprise. But Glaucon's saying, give the Ring of Gyges to someone that you think is just. Give it to Gandhi. Give it to MLK. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Buddha. You know, whatever, whoever you think of as, like, the most virtuous person in your community you give them the ring of Gyges, and Glaucon predicts they're going to end up doing the same things that the unjust person does. 
Maybe not right away, because, you know, character and temperament you know, is a thing, and we have habits to stuff, and it's not like they'd abandon it right away, but you can kind of imagine this, like, do this as an extended metaphor, like, after a while of maybe having that power and still respecting moral considerations, it's going to get really tempting to start using it for other purposes. Um, and maybe even like a twisted version of moral stuff. Uh, I've had some students bring up Death Note before as an example of something that's sort of connected with this kind of theme. The Death Note thing doesn't work perfectly well. And if you're not familiar with Death Note, it's an anime um, about a guy who gets this book that if he writes a name in the book, that person dies. Um, so it gives him this kind of huge power. And he starts using it to try to like punish criminals and then kind of gets a little out of control. <laughs> and that's got some other stuff going on. But... Um, about, like, the corruption of moral motives. But Glaucon's not even thinking about it in that sophisticated of a way. He's just like, you're going to want to, you're going to do things for your own benefit. You're going to start using that power to get the things that you want and the scruples that you have about constraining your actions and your use of power to respect other people, you know, that's, those scruples will fall away eventually. Um, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but but some, at some point they will because and the reason the reason Glaucon has that prediction is this quote right here all men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice playing within the boundaries of morality doesn't really serve you as well in the long run as as a life of injustice and the quick reply is well if you do unjust things then the cops mess with you then people don't like you blah 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 but the Ring of Gyges lets you evade all that. It's like, who cares whether they don't like you or not? They don't have any power over you anymore. Who cares whether the government sees what you're doing as a threat to society? They don't have power over you anymore. You can just do whatever you want without any consequences. And so, of course, you're going to do unjust things, Glaucon thinks, because that's, you, that's the best way to get the life that you want to have, a happy life, a better life. More on that in a second. Um... I think another way Glaucon could have like worded his point here is that um, this is one way I like to word it sometimes on his behalf. Um, imagine you've got this ring of Gyges and you can't use it, so so you can't keep it or something like that. And I don't know, cook up some whatever way in which like aliens or something are forcing you to give this ring to somebody else. Um, would you trust giving that ring, or or you could destroy it, right? You could destroy it too. Would you trust giving the ring to a just person? You might be like, uh, I don't know, man. Like, I think that's a good person. But do you really want to hand them that kind of power? It's the same reason that we're really skeptical of dictators, like benevolent dictatorships. That no person, no matter how moral they are or virtuous they are in their character to begin with, once they're given all that power, they're not going to care anymore. And you've probably heard this kind of quote before that like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But Glaucon's point is basically you're already corrupted. The only reason you don't act on that corrupted nature, um, corrupted nature, is just because of fear. Fear of retaliation, of other people screwing with you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And once those shackles are off, right, once you're off that leash of fear of retaliation, then you're going to just do whatever you want to. Right? And not care. Now, Glaucon's not saying... I've had some students in the past kind of misinterpret this argument. Glaucon's not saying that people are going to turn evil in the sense that they're going to be intentionally malicious. Um, they, they may. I mean, they may have fun messing with people, right? And exerting their power. Power is fun. Um, so it might turn that direction. But it's not that kind of thing. It's not like... Um, you know, there's a Lord of the Rings analogy to be had here for sure. Like Ring of Gaiji sounds a little familiar, right? But um, actually, yeah, let's talk Lord of the Rings because this is a good way of making the point I'm trying to make about Glaucon's argument. He's not saying that you start with a, a good nature and then the ring like is this like evil force that works on you or something like that or that power itself does this evil thing. It's only able to work with what's already there. And if you think, uh, I don't know if, how many of you have read Lord of the Rings or watched the movies. Um, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings from growing up. 
I first read Lord of the Rings in third grade, I think, and then I read it like every year for like seven years. <laughs> I was really into it. Um, and for me, watching the movies, it's like there's a big difference. Um, the way that Peter Jackson sort of tells the story in the movies and the way he like presents it and the acting and everything, the directing direction on it, um, makes it sort of give – it's like the ring is evil. The ring of power is evil and like messes people up. Like it's like like a drug that's messing with their brain or something like that. Um, and really in the books, it's not like that at all. Um, it's more of that uh, the characters that are afraid of the ring or worried about it recognize that the ring um, is just going to work with what's already happening in your nature. Like it just gives you power. And the problem is that no one has the kind of moral character um, to be able to wield that uh, appropriately. Um, so uh, all the scenes that happen in the book with the ring are like people taking their visions of what is good and then um, like losing sight of what is actually moral and just and right. Um, that we have all these little things that we want that then end up taking more um, influence over our decisions than these other kinds of moral values. That and so it's maybe a, a warning about human nature that we aren't capable, uh, perhaps, of being able to value morality intrinsically and have that steadfast commitment to that. Um, and that's the big thing that's going on here, uh, is Glaucon just kind of pointing that out to us, that that's how our natures are. You don't trust anybody. The people in Lord of the Rings, they don't trust themselves with that power, like people like Gandalf or Galadriel or... Uh, Aragorn, the sort of hero characters. They're not heroes in the sense that they have perfect characters. Um, but they know enough. They have enough self-awareness, like Socrates would say, like, know thyself, right? Um, they have enough self-awareness that they d they think it would be a bad idea for them to have that kind of power and influence um, because they wouldn't be able to wield it properly. Okay, so... And that actually is a really good example. Those characters are fantastic examples how even if we have these motives in us, that doesn't mean justice is any less valuable. And that's why those characters make the decision to not take the ring of power and not to try to wield it because they they would rather choose in favor of justice. So they're really they're they're on Socrates' side here of, of treating justice as something intrinsically valuable despite their awareness of their own motives in their heart to the contrary. That's another reason why Glaucon pointing attention to our motives just doesn't do enough to effectively um, uh, support and justify this conclusion. But this third argument, let's get into that. This one's a little stronger. This one's on a little bit better footing. So the reason, if there's, it's one thing that we have a motive in us. Like if human nature is just kind of like corrupted in this kind of way, um, that would be one thing. But it'd be another thing if there's good reason for that. And that's why this third argument actually is starting to give something um, substantial in defense of the conclusion that justice does not have intrinsic value. That just doesn't make sense to treat it that way. It's not so much like we have motives, therefore those motives are right. That's a huge leap in logic that we shouldn't take. Um, but this is more like there are good reasons for taking this kind of value position to treat the value of this thing in this sort of way. And what are those reasons? It basically comes down to happiness. Um, it's, it's a question about what life is better to live. What's a more valuable life? The life of justice or the life of injustice? And this is really getting to what Trasimachus was trying to say, but doing it in a kind of sloppy way in book one of the Republic. Trasimachus wanted to say that um, injustice is good and justice is bad. Right? And, and, what, and by putting it that bluntly, it didn't work so well, but what he was really getting at was this part about, like, justice is for suckers, right? That, that we've mentioned this before in the class, that um, if you live the life, life of justice, you're not going to be able to have a good life. And people who are willing to do unjust things are going to have a better life. And to really highlight this, I, I like the way Glaucon approaches this. Um, it's like, well, let's compare the two lives. And if we're going to do that, what are we going to use as the examples for the comparison? Well, let's treat uh, the just and unjust person in their most idealistic versions. 
So most of us are like kind of mixed, right? We've got maybe some commitment to justice sincerely, um, but then we have all these other selfish motives and, and motivations for injustice, things like that. Callousness towards the well-being of others, selfishness, like an inordinate value on our own happiness over others, stuff like that. Um, so if we're going to imagine in their pure versions, um, I think Glaucon, I, I love the way that Plato does this sort of, how he sets this up. So it's like, what's the height of injustice? Like, what's the most unjust person imaginable? Well, it's not just someone who does all these terrible things. It's someone who has the added sort of sin, you might say, of deception, that they're able to convince everyone that they're actually a good person. They're masquerading. They're lying to everyone. They're wearing this mask of being a moral person when in reality they're deeply unjust. This is what's defined as the height of injustice, doing unjust actions, but going further in lying to it to everybody else and being effective at that. So the unjust person uh, is capable of getting all the advantages of doing unjust actions without any of the bad stuff because no one knows that they're unjust, right? So no one's going to do any retaliation against them. They're not going to resist them. They're, in fact, going to try to support them. Right? They're going to like give them the honors and benefits of the appearance of being just. Um, and this is, I mean, we could just do examples for days. But there's, um, whether it's from like corporations to politicians or something like that, right? People or uh, religious leaders in some instances, right? They're like appearing like they're these holy people or righteous people or just people who are working for the betterment of others. And in reality, they're doing all these corrupt things and maybe even like take like the Catholic priest controversy, like actually doing deep injustices to people sort of behind the scenes. And it's all covered up and that kind of thing. Um, that's the kind of person we're imagining as the ideal unjust person. And they've got it pretty good. That's Glaucon's point. They're getting all the advantage. It's a win-win, right? The best of both worlds. All the advantages of doing actually unjust actions with all the advantages of, that come from public regard for being a good person. Just they don't have to actually do the good thing. It's like, uh, imagine if you um, like lied about donating a bunch of money to charity. Like People are going to be like, wow, that's really cool. Hey, let me buy you a beer or something. Like I just want to thank you for doing that incredible charity, but you didn't actually pay the money. You didn't actually make the sacrifice, right? Be like, sweet, I get to keep the money and I get all these benefits? Awesome. That's the, that's the unjust life. So it's full of all the other things that we might think of as part of a valuable life. That's what Glaucon's going for it, right? You get all this power to enjoy these benefits. Okay, now what about the ideal just person? What would be the most extreme version of someone who actually does value morality for itself intrinsically and is 100% committed to those values, never going to compromise them, always going to uphold them, what is their life going to look like? Well, the most extreme version of that would be that they continue to do the just thing. Their commitment to justice does not waver even when it no longer works to their benefit. Right? Even when there, there's no longer anything that they get out of it. And how to imagine that? Well, the best way to do that is to imagine that everyone believes them, falsely, to be unjust. So the way everyone else treats them, the way society looks at them, um, is as the unjust person. Someone to be punished, someone to be restricted, um, someone to, be the, the, to take good things away from them and give them bad things, right? And even in those situations, even when the whole world has turned their back on them, that they're not going to reward them for their just deeds or anything like that. They still do the right thing. They don't be like, well, as long as everyone's going to treat me as the unjust person, I might as well do unjust things too. They continue to, do, to live a life constrained by justice, concerned for others, serving them um, without being, with, yeah, just not getting cynical, not get, giving up. Um, there's actually a good biblical example of this, and that would be Job. Job is an example of this kind of person for those of you who are familiar with the Job story. Because, uh, well, and those of you who are not, there's a Old Testament story in the Bible about um, like this wager between God and, and Satan 
um, God's like, check out my man Job. He's so righteous and awesome. He loves me so much, and he loves justice so much. And Satan's like, oh, man, he only does that stuff because his life is comfortable. He's kind of taking the cynical view of, of this, like, Glaucon, Trisimachus position, right? And God's like, no, he's not. He really cares about righteousness. He's so righteous that he cares about righteousness for its own sake. So God agrees to with the, this kind of experiment, with this bet with Satan, to throw all these terrible things at Job. Just, like, ruin his life. Like, everything that is good in life is taken away from him. Like, nonstop tragedy. Everyone hates him. They think he's stupid. Uh, unjust even, and he continues to honor God and honor what is right. He doesn't give up on that. He doesn't abandon the values, all that sort of thing. He doesn't even have this like holier-than-thou attitude about it. The very end of Job, if you read it, it's like, he's like, I'm I'm just, I'm not that great. Like, I, I just need to serve and try to do what's right. I mean, he's, he's very modest. Uh, he doesn't have this like expanded ego about the, like where he's trying to like drum himself up to be righteous or something. He's he actually doesn't even think that he's all that righteous himself. Um, but he still he just stays committed to the value of what is just and what's right. Uh, another example I like to use is um, a Harrison Ford movie called The Fugitive. Um, the Fugitive is an old movie. It's awesome. If you haven't seen it, too bad. There's gonna be spoilers here. Um, and maybe you could skip ahead a few minutes if you don't want to hear the spoilers. It's it's a very good movie. Even if you got the spoilers, it's it's worth it. I mean, I guess it's not really all that much spoilers. You kind of the the setup is pretty clear from the beginning. But anyway, in the Fugitive, Harrison Ford's character is a doctor who's falsely accused of killing his wife, murdering his wife. He gets convicted. He goes to jail, and they're transferring him from uh, one prison to another. I think, and um, there's a car accident with the bus, the prison bus that he's in, and he escapes. And he's on the run, and Tommy Lee Jones is plays this U.S. Marshal who's, like, hunting him down. It's really, it's a classic. It's a great movie. But basically, I mean, the whole world is against him. Um, law enforcement thinks he's guilty. Everyone on the uh, sees the news, you know, and they're like, it's a big manhunt, right? And there's a number of moments in the story where... Harrison Ford's character has the chance to kind of like work to his own self-interest, right? To like try to escape. But there's some other like moral concern that uh, is in front of him. Uh, one scene, he's in the hospital trying to like collect records to figure out what happened. Um, he's like piecing together the mystery of who killed his wife, right? Um, and he sees that this kid has been misdiagnosed because he's a doctor, right? There's this kid about to go into surgery. He's been misdiagnosed. And the surgery is going to, like, kill him or something. I mean, I, maybe I'm exaggerating it. But there's some serious harm about to happen to this kid. And he sees the cops show up in the hospital because they're like, maybe he's going to try to go back to the hospital kind of thing. And he like, wants to run away. But then he's like, but there's a kid. So he stays and, like, forges a doctor note to, like, change it to make sure that the kid gets the right procedure. Um, and puts himself at greater risk. Now, he still escapes. But, you know, if he was really thinking in a self-interested way... He would have just left that kid, right? But he doesn't. He still is committed to justice even when the whole world is turned against him. So um, that is an example of this, like, vision of, like, true virtue, right? But what's Glaucon's point about it? Well, it sucks. That life sucks because you don't get any of the advantages of doing unjust actions. And you get all the problems with being seen as being unjust, right? Because he's falsely understood to be unjust. Um, so that's terrible, right? Uh, Glaucon thinks that the choice between these two lives in terms of their value is just so obvious that he puts it in this rhetorical way. He says, let judgment be given which of them is the happier of the two. Like, which person is happier? The just person or the unjust person? It's like, duh, it's the unjust person kind of thing. Now, that's a much stronger sort of argument because it's saying... Here's a thing that you care about. Here's a value that we kind of all agree on. Like, happy life is better than an unhappy life. Well, if you care about that, what are you going to do? Are you going to live the just life or the unjust life? Nah, eh, you're probably going to go for the unjust life. That's just it's just smarter. Just a way to go. So that's, a, that's, a, that's not an appeal to a motive or an aspect of our psychology or something to prove what's really better. 
this is a normative judgment to say like here's a value that supports doing this over doing that okay so it gives a, an actual legitimate reason and a lot of this whole debate is really about happiness and that's where Plato ends up taking the discussion further too in the Republic okay now uh, before we get into Adamantus's contributions here notice how Glaucon's thinking about this really from the standpoint of the individual what reason do I have for being for valuing justice for its own sake or valuing morality for its own sake and that's how he's kind of approaching it Adamantus is going kind of in a different direction Adamantus is now thinking about uh, this in society about not on the level of the individual but in the collective in the group and I wouldn't necessarily put the uh, Adamantus's contributions here as like arguments per se they're not really arguments as I have them listed here in my lecture notes as like concerns Okay, so Adamantus has some concerns about this discussion of what's the value of justice as it reflects in society. Um, there's there's kind of two levels on which um, Adamantus has these concerns, and that's this bullet point here, society's attitude towards justice, and then down here, this part about the perspective of the youth. What's what's really going on with this idea is. Uh, Adamantus is making observations about how society runs okay and if you I don't know how many of you have taken some sociology classes or, or think about um, you know analysis of society and culture and things like that but any sociologist the kind of research that they do the kind of theorizing that they do happens on really two levels um, these are kind of I would say the two spheres of sociology one of them is cultural analysis and cultural analysis is like what are the messages that are being propagated in a in a society so there what are the values of that society what are the beliefs of that society things on that kind of level um, so like you know sociologists will do things like analyze popular movies to see like what are what are the ways in which society is thinking about these things because art is sort of a reflection of society it reflects back to us it also shapes it too it's kind of a feedback loop but it's a reflection it could be a way to gain some kind of idea of what's going on like if you want to understand a culture look at the stories it tells you know what are the stories that people enjoy and pass along and what's it, to get a glimpse into what the worldview is like okay so that's that's all this stuff about attitude the second stuff uh, this other aspect of sociological analysis is just looking at how a society functions um, what are the rules of the game like how is it set up right how are people able to navigate life in society what are the rules of how that all works um, that's this kind of other level this functionalist or mechanistic level of what's happening with society and Adamantus is looking at it through both lenses by the way I just I can't help just can't help but point out like when I read Plato like you might be wondering like why are we reading this ancient stuff why not talk about like more contemporary sources for these ideas and it's like, well, I think it's kind of cool to see that even way back in the ancient world, like way before any of the modern modernization, um, sort of modern political systems and technology and all that kind of stuff, all the education that's happened and all the science, like there's still these <laughs> basic things. Like Plato's got in these little comments here, like he's, he's basically nailing the two levels on which sociological analysis happens. Like it's like... I, it's just mind blowing to me. It's it's. I I always say like I think maybe Plato had a time machine or something. It's just uncanny how the the number of things that he anticipates without even trying very hard. Okay, so um, let's talk about them one by one. So layer one is about these attitudes of society, <clears throat> and Anamantis sees the society's attitude about justice reflected in different spheres, and he brings them up. One is like what's going on with child rearing. How do children, how are uh, parents raising their children? Um, what's their attitude about that? What's going on with religion? And again, this is ancient Greek religion, so this polytheistic thing, you know, Zeus and Athena and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Ooh. And then um, this part about hypocrisy, what I have labeled as hypocrisy, which is really just more about power. Uh, the positions of power in society and the double standards that go on there but really hypocrisy is kind of the whole game here 
um, <clears throat> society is saying one thing about justice, but when you look at how it's actually operating, um, it goes a different direction. So let's start at the top here. When children are being raised by their parents, you know, Adam Ansis is like, why do parents try to make their children good? Like, most parents want their kids to live just lives. But they don't do it because they value justice for its own sake. What they're worried about is the well-being of their children. They want their children to have good lives. And parents are worried, Adam Ansis thinks, that their commitment to, like, trying to make their kids good people is really just a kind of prudent act, um, as he puts it, for the sake of character and reputation. That if their kids do evil things and everyone knows it, then they're not going to be able to gain the advantages in life that they need to have a successful life, right? The appearance of justice is what matters, and the actual reality of it doesn't. Now, Adam Ants has taken a pretty cynical view on this, and you might be like, well, not so fast. Like, <clears throat> I don't think my parents did that with me. I don't think they're only concerned about my well-being, that they don't care about justice for its own sake. Um, and that's where this is a little controversial. You might disagree with Adam Ants about this, but... You might also be like, nah, I kind of see what you're seeing here, Adamantis, that like parents are mostly worried about their children leading successful lives, happy lives, you know, just like Glaucon was talking about over here, right? This is from the perspective of an individual, but for a parent that's like sort of paternalistically trying to set their children up for success, they're using the same logic Adamantis is thinking. Okay, and then when it comes to religion... He says, same sort of thing. It's all about appearance and not much about substance. Religion talks a big talk about justice and encourages people to live virtuous lives. Um, but how do they really talk about it? They talk about it this way, in terms of benefit and punishment. That if you act justly, if you live a righteous life, then the gods will benefit you. They will bless your life with all these good things. And if you do evil, you'll be punished by the gods, and that will suck, and you'll be unhappy, and all this kind of stuff. Now, this is ancient Greece, right? And ancient Greek religious traditions are not so prevalent <laughs> as much anymore. And they've been there are other religions that are much more common uh, at this point in history. Um, but I will say, being someone who lives in religious circles and participates in religion, and you know this about me, um, I will say that I see this a lot. I see what Adamantus is talking about. Um, that it's like if you live a good life, you'll go to heaven. If you live a bad life, you'll go to hell. So that's like the religions of the book kind of have that thing going on. God will punish you sort of thing. And that gives you a motive to live a good life. Um, and this, But the same kind of stuff happens in Eastern traditions too. It's not just these Western religions. Um there's some big questions with Buddhism that it, is it not just something selfish like I don't want to suffer so I will live a life of compassion just for the sake of getting personal peace and bliss so that I don't I can have a better life for myself and maybe not as much about being concerned about other people for their own sake um, there is actually a big there's a big disagreement in the tradition of Buddhism that really that the deviation point comes about concerns about that issue of what sort of motivation is being given to participate in those values, whether they're being done um, altruistically or whether they're being done um, from self motive, self interest motive, a motivation of self interest. So that's a big question. Um, I don't think this is irrelevant just because it's a different religious tradition. I think you see the same kind of logic. Now, I'll also say that, at least in my experience, um, it's not so obvious that religion has the same kind of hypocrisy thing going on. I, I mean, pff, I wouldn't participate in it if I thought that's all it was. Uh, maybe that just is evidence in itself. But um, there's, I, I think there's a lot of sincere people who are religious, and uh, many forms of all the religious traditions. You'll find people who are criticizing this kind of thing, especially if you think if you're if you're just looking at like mainstream Christianity in America. There's a lot of this sort of like bribery fear thing going on of like going to heaven versus going to hell. 
you that that card gets played so much. Like the guy on the street corner is like yelling at the megaphone, like you're gonna go to hell. Da, 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 da. You need to con- accept Jesus as your savior. Blah blah blah. You know, that kind of stuff is definitely playing on those motives. Um, but there are so many voices in these religious traditions that are like that is the wrong path for why you should care about this stuff. Like that is hypocritical. Um, it, it's a it's a twisted version of the proper motives for faith or for religious commitment or concern about justice, All right? Because this really is more about what you can get out of morality than valuing it for its own sake, right? So that's the same sort of thing. All right, and then finally, there's this um, point about hypocrisy that Adamantus throws out there, and this has mostly to do with power. So, like, how does society talk about just and unjust people? Well, they talk, you know, in loose abstract terms about how being a, a just person is a good thing and will want to reward you for being good and we're going to punish the evildoers and that kind of thing. But that really only happens with people who are powerless, right? The people who get punishment for their bad actions are the ones who are on the bottom ends of the totem pole, like, you know, low-level criminals, um, like drug dealers, gang members, stuff like that. I'm going to take a pause for a second here. Sorry about the interruption. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the people who are relatively powerless in society, don't have a lot of influence or money or anything like that. They're the ones who have the book thrown at them. They're the ones that the justice system like operates on in the way that the justice system at least is supposed to, it says it's supposed to work with the rules and stuff. Like The judges would be like, them the rules, man. But when it comes to people who are powerful... They can evade all that shit. They can get around it. And society doesn't really want to challenge them about it. Like politicians, business leaders, you know, people like that. Maybe religious leaders too that do unjust things. They are the kind of status that they have in society shields them from having to face the consequences. So even though society talks about punishing evil um, and injustice, it doesn't actually do it when those people are powerful. Um, and the same thing kind of thrown in reverse when it comes to benefit. Um, if someone's very powerful and they do like public acts of charity or have virtuous things going on, then society wants to reward them. It's like just a rationalization for giving them more power, uh, like an excuse for them to have the power that they have, to like legitimate it. That's why every corporation wants a PR department, why every politician has a public relations staff member who's like, you know, keeping track of their image and their brand and trying to protect that public image of them. Um, but when it comes to people who are powerless, who are on the bottom rungs of society, it doesn't matter how virtuous they live their lives, how much dedication they have to other people, um, to the country, uh, to each other, yeah, uh, to um, like being hard workers, all that kind of stuff. That's going to be just taken for granted and basically neglected. They're not going to really see any benefit from it. Um, that's what Adamantus is talking about. <clears throat> they despise and overlook the poor and the weak, even if they are just, and still continues to honor unjust people when they are rich and powerful. Now, you know, the world of ancient Athens, which is where this is coming from, is a different one from ours, but arguably these patterns have still taken shape. They're like our world still works this way. Um, it just looks a little different. But the same principle and phenomenon is in effect. Like I was mentioned, the PR kind of stuff. Um, I mean, the, the basic idea is that you don't want to screw with people who have a lot of power. If you're going to accuse them of injustice and try to hold them accountable, you better be able to back that up. right? And that's why you might say that's the whole point of having a government, is to have this kind of, um, and the police, to like have an authority backed up with power that can then deal with even really powerful criminals. Like, people love to tell the stories about Al Capone, you know, and like big, these big, um, powerful criminal leaders that then get brought to justice, you know, or, or maybe even like the Nixon case, you know, impeachment of Nixon. And sometimes there's those cases, but more often than not, those, those ca- people th- that do unjust things that are powerful don't ever meet with justice, right? Um, I've been teaching business ethics for the last few years and, and, uh, one of the patterns that you see is when like something like really goes wrong, morally wrong in the business world. Um, the people who really go to prison 
tend to be more like middle management. They don't tend to be the top. Top people sometimes get to keep their jobs, like take home a big bonus that year, or they pull out, right? They take all their assets out um, before the company gets slapped with fines and all this kind of thing, and they're just fine. They just move on to their next job rather than they really face the consequences of this stuff. So those are those are all about how society um, talks about justice. It talks a big game, and it doesn't back it up. And that's one thing that could be disturbing, right? This is a concern of Adamantus. He's like, Ugh, whoa, our world works like this. You're like, ugh. If you care about justice, you just have to be like, what? That's messed up. But it's even worse. And that's the second concern here. And I was mentioning, I was describing this earlier as like the mechanisms of society, the rules about how it functions and works. Um, that if you wanted to, like, like think about your world, you know, as your life is opening up before you right now. Like, you're going to, you need to find a job, you're, you know, what's your place in society? What are the tools and resources you have at your disposal to try to make that life happen? That depends not just on you, but on everything else that's going on. And not just about the actions of other people, but these kinds of institutions of society. Which can include cultural elements, but it can also include legal elements, um, and a bunch of other stuff, too. Um, patterns of how the business world works, the, how the economic system is running. Those are all things that set up rules. I play tons of board games, board game cabinets back here. Um, and a lot of them are economic. And there's a way in which living in, our, in society is like playing a really complicated board game. Right, there's all these different mechanisms, and how are you going to get your victory points, right? How are you going to um, make a successful life, right? So Adamantus kind of frames this up by saying, imagine someone who's young, the perspective of the youth, um, someone who basically is an outsider to society, right? They've been raised, but, you know, sheltered in the home sort of thing. And then they're getting to the age where now they're starting to get, they're starting to see what's going on in the world, and they're now invited to participate with it. They're going to be building a life, right? But So they're an outsider entering into that game. They're starting to get roped into the game. Um, and the question is, as he says, they'll ask themselves, can I by justice or by crooked ways of deceit ascend a loftier tower which may be a fortress to me all my days? In other words, what's my best path for success? Should it be living a just life or an unjust life? Um, which one's going to be more effective given the rules of the game? Right, like so, you learn the rules of like a board game, and then you're trying to decide like what's the best strategy for how to play within these rules to achieve the objective and win, right? And you're like, maybe I try this, maybe I try that. What's going to be the best strategy here? Trying to work that out. Same thing here. You're entering into the game that society sets up these rules for, um, and what is going to be the way to go? And the bottom line here is that Adamantus thinks that society is set up in a way that actually promotes and encourages unjust living. Not just in terms of how it talks about justice and morality, but in terms of the rules of how it functions. Um, and this is this is what Adamantus thinks is this youth, this young person is going to answer. That if they're trying to make a good life, to appearance, I must devote myself. So do everything I can to appear just. Right, to make sure people don't have any excuses for coming down on me, get some leverage against me, right? But behind, I will trail the subtle and crafty fox. I love these quotes. Um, what that means is that secretly, look to gain your advantage wherever you can, including doing unjust things. So appear just, but don't actually hold yourself captive in your choices to what justice demands from you. So to appear just and in reality be unjust. And if this looks familiar... It should. I mean, there's a big point Adamantus is making. It's not just that society promotes injustice. It promotes the height of injustice, as we defined it earlier in Glaucon's arguments. That's kind of the culmination of all this. That not only does society, like, encourage or tolerate unjust living, but it actually, the way it's set up by, like, talking about justice but not really backing it up with the substance, um, not really following through on that, and all the other systems that are set up, encourages people to do the to live the worst kind of life the one that does injustice and lies about it 
and is deceptive about it and does it secretly behind the scenes um, that adds more injustice on top of that basic injustice. Now, uh, Adam Antis is aware that like this kind of answer may be treated controversially, but he doesn't think it's going to really come down to um, too much of a threat. Uh, for one thing, one objection is there's great risk inherent in such a venture. Like you're going to play the two, like maybe it's more prudent to just be just and then you will be fine um, rather than to like do unjust things and try not to get caught. And this reply that, that Adamantus gives is like classic ancient Greek sentiment here. Nothing great is easy, right? That if you're going to actually accomplish something significant, it's going to be risky, right? But it still means it's better. Even if it's hard, it's still what's actually objectively better if you can pull it off. Maybe if you're too weak, you're not crafty enough, you're not subtle enough, then maybe that's a more prudent thing. But there's a strong, there are strong reasons to think this is really the best option. And then there's this other thing, well, like, you could deceive people, but you can't deceive the gods, right? You, or if you want to do it in a monotheistic tone of voice, you could say, God sees everything. The, he will see your sin, and you will be punished in hell no matter how sneaky you are on earth. <laughs> kind of, you know, like, God sees everything. Um, and then there's a few replies here that Adamantus makes that are very interesting. Maybe there are no gods. So they're not going to take that for granted. You know, maybe atheism, agnosticism, right? So it doesn't matter. Or, even if God exists, maybe he doesn't care. Like, why should we think he does actually care about this? And this is also, this is a little bit more in the ancient Greek context um, about how they, their attitude about their gods, this plural um, polytheistic sort of thing. Um, but the way th things happen in this ancient Greek religion, it's like, even if there are gods and they care, you can still atone and walk away with all the benefits without the costs, right? So you do these unjust things, you know, maybe secretly, and then you're like, you know, do some sacrifices for the gods, and it'll be all cool. Remember, the context for the Republic is just getting done doing a bunch of religious rites, right? So this is like, right, they're right next to this big temple when they're talking about this. So it's like right on everyone's minds. So uh, maybe there are some ways to like hedge your bets here with divine powers. Now, if you're coming from, say, especially like a Christian background or a monotheistic background here, this might not sound like, like if you're Jewish, Christian, or uh, a Muslim, this argument probably doesn't sound that convincing to you, thinking of it in your theological lens. Um, but there's some versions of this that are pretty close, like um, especially in... in um, well, actually, in all, in all three of those those religions of the book, the uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of them have this way in which God is a forgiving God. Right? If you screw things up, there's always the chance to kind of turn things around again. Um, this is especially true in Lutheranism, where the the Christian tradition that I'm that I come from. Um, with Lutherans, it's like, yeah, every, everything is a matter of God's free gift of salvation to everybody. There's no strings attached to it. And you don't have to be righteous in order to be saved. That's the whole point of being saved from your sins, is that you don't need to do anything for it. Um, you just you just accept God's gift for you. But this sets up this problem, what's called cheap grace, that you could just be like, think about gaming the system, right? Like, I'll, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, do all these terrible things, you know, be unjust, live an immoral life, sin. And then, like, right before I die, I'll be like, save me, Jesus. And then and then Jesus will save you, and you're like, sweet, win-win, right? <laughs> Don't have to go to hell, and I got to live how I wanted to. That's the kind of angle that's going on here. But even in a more sincere way, like we were talking about earlier, up here with this stuff, I mean, if your motive for doing justice is just that you're afraid of God punishing you for it. Um, it's kind of just treating morality as like a bully. Like what if God had different commands? What if he didn't want people to do moral things or didn't care about justice and was just like, if you don't do what I want, then I'm going to throw you in hell. I mean, that doesn't seem like it has any moral value to it. Like that can't be what sincere moral values are all about. We talked about this a little, this kind of concern about how you defend or give people reasons or motives for justice with our discussion that we had on Monday, where I was saying like a lot of the stuff we had on the board was probably not capable of, 
rationally justifying why morality is something that you should care about. They're just ways to try to find motives for moral-looking behavior. Oh, pardon me. Mm. They're just motives for moral-looking behavior rather than having sincere regard. And the same kind of concern here is about what, what's going on with religion and religious appeals. Again, I think there's other options here. You don't have to go that way. But those sorts of, the, the way Adam Antis is sort of talking about this is in, the, is in this more like gaming the system kind of way. Okay. And I like this quote here. Let, let's take a look at this. The cause of all this, the reason society is set up like this, was indicated when my brother and I, the Glaucon, told you how astonished we were to find that all the professing panegyrists, just people who are like public speakers, you know, people who are like politicians or social workers, you know, advocates, um, people protesting, stuff like that. All the people who um, talk publicly about justice, no one has ever blamed injustice or praised justice except with the view to the glories, honors, and benefits which flow from them. That's how they, Glaucon and Adam Ances, have always heard the arguments given for why they should care about justice and morality. And like we saw with when we looked at some of these quotes on Wednesday, you know, Adam Ances is like, let other people, let those panegyrists, those public speakers, uh, praise justice and censure injustice in this kind of way by talking about reward and punishment. And that's a manner of arguing that I'm, I'm used to from them. That's what I expect. But Socrates, you are someone who thinks about justice as a philosopher, not in a practical sort of way, but just justice for its own sake. And I and he's like, I expect something better out of you. I better see an argument for why justice has this kind of intrinsic value, rather than just bribing people or threatening them in order to get them to fall in line with moral values. Okay, okay so the big question here is, on what principle then shall we any longer choose justice rather than the worst injustice, the, the this thing, this strategy that Adamantus was talking about, to appear just, but in reality to be unjust. I love these quotes. I want to read them to you. They're just like, they just hit right home here. Um, I think this is Adamantus. Adamantus is the older brother, so he's got a little bit more of a picture on society than Glaucon does. Glaucon's kind of more in himself, right, as an individual being like, what am I going to do? Adamance is a little older, a little more worldly wise, this kind of thing. He says, how can a man who has any superiority of mind or person or rank or wealth, that is anyone who has any kind of power, be willing to honor justice or indeed to refrain from laughing when he hears justice praised? He puts this little caveat in there because if you're poor and weak, then you want people to care about justice because it's going to have a benefit for you, right? They're going to care about you. But anyone who's got power, who doesn't need help from other people, how are they going to refrain from laughing when they hear justice praised? Because it's just, you know, given all these cynical arguments, on what grounds could there be any legitimate reason for giving up power and sacrificing the happiness of your own life? It just doesn't make any sense, he's saying. And even if there should, and this is a, this is a very interesting argument that Adam Ansis kind of throws in here toward the end. Even if there should be someone who is satisfied that justice is best. Like, I, when I read this quote, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of me. Like, I try to have a really sincere relationship with morality and justice. Um, I know I'm not perfect about that. But it's like, that's something I want to work on. I want to have a better relationship with this stuff. I want to value it for its own sake. I don't want my commitment to morality to be premised on all these other sorts of ulterior motives. Kind of like with Kant's philosophy, right? I don't want to live a moral life just because it makes me feel good or it fits with my desires or my preferences, but to respect the goodness of morality for its own sake and to do it for that reason, to have it guide my choices for that reason. So I might try to like be like, okay, yeah, all right. So yeah, I'm satisfied. Justice is best, even though if I don't perfectly do it and my commitment to it is not, is not p totally pure. Still... That person is not angry with people who are unjust, but is ready to forgive them because you know that people are not just of their own free will. Right? So when people do unjust things, it's understandable. You know where they're coming from, even if you're like, that's still wrong, but you're like, I know how tough it is to care about justice. Even the person who's trying to do that, right? If I'm like using myself, like, I want to be just. I think this is the right way that my life should be oriented, that it should be uh, structured, 
And when I look at other people who aren't doing that, um, like I can get angry at them sometimes, but I'm also like, I get it. Like a lot of the anger is just frustration. Like I know why you're doing that stuff because you want those things. You want these good things in your life and you think this is the way that you're going to be able to get them. I get it. I understand it. It may not be that you're directly malicious, right? But you're just trying to make the best life and the best life is achieved through injustice. You know, that's what makes it so tough. That's why it's so hard to set aside the desires and to care about justice for its own sake and do it only for that reason, right? So what, what Adamantus is really saying here is from that observation, you understand the logic on the cynical side and you accept it. That's what, that's what the, the real, like, uh, that's a little twist that goes on here with this argument. It's very, very interesting. Um, okay. So I've got some more things to say. I'm, I know I'm, I'm up at 60 minutes here. I want to, if I can keep you for a little bit longer here, I want to kind of, we, we basically got through the meat of this reading about all the stuff about uh, Glaucon and Adamantus' concerns. And if you're waiting for Plato's answer, I could give you a little bit of that. But I'm, um, this is why I wanted to have the discussion that we had on Monday, is that I wanted us to kind of think about the answers. Because, um, as I mentioned last week, or this week, the entire Republic is an attempt to answer this question. So Plato's, Plato's answer is kind of sophisticated and complicated and it takes a long time for him to get it all out. So I couldn't give you it as a part of the reading. Um, the reading selections we have are just posing the problem and not really giving a solution. And that's why I wanted us to kind of brainstorm our reasons and thinking for it. I've got some of my own thoughts about this. I, I mentioned, I think, at the beginning of this unit that um, I really care about this topic. And in my own work as an ethicist, um, answering this question, why be moral? And what's the argument for even getting into this game? Seems very, very important to answer. Because there's so many bad answers. <laughs> there's so many things that don't actually seem to justify concern for morality as something intrinsically valuable. And instead, you're just getting things like bribery, like motives for living a moral lifestyle, rather than genuinely caring about moral matters. And it, I think for a lot of people, it's actually mysterious. Like, why do I do this stuff? If I really had the power, like the Ring of Gyges, why wouldn't I use it for injustice, right? What would convince me that I shouldn't do that? They'd be like, yeah, oh, it would make sense not to do that. Um, and there's a lot of different routes to take here. But And I, I've got some of my favorites um, for how to give a more legitimate argument for why be moral. If you're interested in it, let me know. Um, it takes a little while for me to share my argument because it's it's, it's, a, it's a little more complicated. Um, but I don't want to make this class about Tim Lineman philosophy, so I'm not going to like give you a big lecture on it. Um, but if you're curious about it, let me know, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, if I, I think this is also a question that's kind of... Mm, I, yeah, I, I guess I want to say it's kind of personal. Like I think it's the kind of thing that you have to take a personal journey on. Um, someone can't tell you it. right? Like I can share you what my thoughts are and and the reasons that... I found persuasive about this, um, but no one can tell you to have sincerity, right? They can't twist your arm to that. You can have your arm twisted to be convinced to do all sorts of other things, but to genuinely believe that something has value and accept those arguments requires looking at those arguments with a sincere attitude about it, and no one can like strong arm you into that. They can get you to maybe in brute force like accept certain facts about reality, right? But not, not an answer to this kind of question. The truth of the answer to the question, why be moral, is, is something that I, I believe kind of can only happen through um, going through that journey of considering those reasons yourself. There, there's not this answer that can just be plopped in front of you. Going on the journey is actually part of the argument, I think. Um, but anyway, that's, that's some other of my thoughts about that. Okay, let's talk, I want to I share a little bit more at the close of this lecture about what Plato is up to. Um, so again, uh, Glaucon the, and Adamantus, they don't agree with these positions. They've been playing devil's advocate. They're trying to get something better out of Socrates, and, and arguably they do. Um, Socrates' answer I'm not very satisfied with. Just as a quick um, rundown, Socrates' answer to this question, why live a life of justice, is... Uh, really connected, you can maybe see the hints of it based on how he's framing the debate. Because the debate's been framed in this way of like happiness, right? Be happy or not be. Um, is What's the best way to achieve happiness through justice or not? 
just living, unjust living. And Socrates goes on to try to explain how living an unjust life won't make you happy, ever. There's no way to escape, basically, karma. Um, now, Plato's not a Hindu or Buddhist or something. He doesn't believe in karma, per se. But the kind of phenomenon that uh, Hinduism and Buddhism have in mind with karma is the way in which you are affected by your own actions. The choices that you make end up affecting your own character. Um, and basically... It can you know you can build yourself into a prison of uh, suffering effectively? Um, so you need to be careful about that. And that's kind of what Plato's going for, for all practical purposes. Living an unjust life, he thinks, uh, happens because of a kind of disharmony in yourself, in your soul. And to live a just life, if you live in accordance with justice, you will have a harmonious soul. And that's an uh, intrinsic connection with happiness. Um, that's the real short part of it. There's a lot of more complicated things here about Plato's you know, claims about how is the soul constructed and structured and why will just actions versus unjust actions have these harmonious or disharmonious effects on the soul. And I, I'm not going to get into all those details now. I'd be happy to talk to you about it at, at some point outside of class if you're curious. But the the... That you got the basic strategy, and the concern with it is again a kind of like bribery, that I'm doing it out of self-interest rather than actually able to I'm, that I'm actually able to use that as an argument for why I should consider other people as intrinsically valuable per se, like the way that um, Kant and Mill definitely have going on with their moral theories that we studied earlier this quarter. Um, so that's where Plato ends up kind of going and taking it. Um, there's there's maybe some more things to be said for him. I'd, I'm worried about turning him into a straw man here, um, but that is there's there's definitely room for those kinds of concerns, um, those kinds of objections to the proposal that Plato is putting on the table. Um, I think he's got some other resources to maybe respond to those concerns. But the main thing that uh, is relevant to the selections that you did have here is I is the stuff I want to call attention to about how Plato is intentionally constructing the drama the way that he is. And I think there's some takeaways here. Um, there are other ways that he could have presented this debate and the arguments that are involved in it. Um, he could have just had it all done through Trasimachus, right? I mean, it's not like Plato is hamstrung by, you know, videotaping a conversation that actually happened and he has to just stick to what happened for the script here. I mean, he definitely this is from later Plato writings. And at this point, we think, in terms of Plato's scholarship, that he's taking a lot more liberties with things that have historical touchstones, like actual people, actual events, that kind of stuff. But he's taking a lot of liberties with the conversation and, and where the debates end up going. So um, there's no reason to think that this actual conversation happened. In fact, there's a lot of good reason to think this conversation did not happen because the views that Plato gives to Socrates in the Republic don't seem to square with everything we know about what the historical Socrates actually believed. So at this point, it's probably Plato using Socrates as a sock puppet. But he's also using all the other characters in the, in the drama, too, um, in these sorts of intentional ways. What is the intention behind it is a good question. Um, I think the, the big thing to point out is that Socrates gives these cynical arguments... Um, he gives them through the brothers, Glaucon and Adamantus. And what's significant about them is that they don't actually believe it, right? They're playing devil's advocate for this position instead of just sincerely believing it. There are actually a few other dialogues where um, there are characters who you know, really do have this kind of cynical um, belief uh, explicitly. They're committed to it. It's a whole project that they're operating under. Um, what is it? The... Uh, uh, the Gorgias, the the dialogue of the Gorgias is a really good example of this. It's this like older philosopher teacher who's a sophist and his younger students. <laughs> and even by the older guy's standards, he's like, oh, these young students are like going crazy within with this like thought of like, I can do all this injustice because it's all about power and it's not about virtue and um, not about justice for its own sake and stuff like that. And in those dialogues, um, the interaction between those characters and Socrates 
is mostly a matter of Socrates just trying to get them to own up to what they really believe. I mean, all the debate is just like pulling teeth on getting them to be open, sort of, and revealed and exposed for what they actually believe. Because they're hiding it the whole time. They're being sneaky about it. Um, whereas Glaucon and Adamantus are just, they're just laying it all out on the table. Because they don't actually hold the belief. Why would that be true? Well, I think there's this kind of psychological effect that um, if if someone actually was convinced of this position, that what is the best life is to appear just and in reality be unjust, then that would give them uh, the motivation to not actually own up to what they're doing, right? <laughs> then the game would be, the, the jig would be up, right? If they were like, oh yeah, this is how I live and this is why I think it's the right idea. So I think that's one reason why Plato has it set up this way. But there's a deeper reason, and that's this one I got down here in my lecture notes. That if, if we had this cynical position embodied in a character who genuinely believed it, then the reader would be like almost instantly turned off to the debate. Um, there would be this rhetorical force of demonizing that character. If someone just came out and was like, yeah, I totally do this. Like, think about the, the social reaction to that um, pharmaceutical CEO, Martin Shkreli, that happened this last year. He's now in prison, right, where he had all these, like, public comments about how he was going to, like, raise uh, the prices on these, like, crucial pharmaceutical products and, and medicines for people who desperately need it. He's just, like, making bank off of them. And he's just an unapologetic capitalist. Like, he's smirking in the courtroom and scoffing and everything. And people just like roasted him alive. They're just like, this dude's a straight up asshole. Like throw the book at him. Like put him in prison. Um, if someone was really blatant in their approval for the logic of the arguments that Glaucon and, Ad and Adamantus are throwing out there, then the reader would probably not look at their views with much charity and probably just dismiss them rather than take them seriously as something that you have to debate with, that you have to argue against, right? To have the charity for it. So... I think that's another reason why Plato is doing things this way, is that he wants us to actually think about it, rather than just be like, oh, that's wrong. Because that's, I, I, like I said here, I think Plato really believes, where is this here? Um, yeah, I think Plato, I think Plato generally believes that Adamantus' characterization of society is accurate. That the concerns that he has are not like, oh, no, it's not that bad. That it actually is that bad. Like, Plato's an idealist. But he's a realist about humanity and society and our relationship with morality. That we don't value it for its own sake. So I think he wants this stuff on the table. He wants us to take a look at it and have to confront it. Um, and overcome it rather than just blow it off. Because that's exactly what Adamantus is describing is how society works. It talks a big talk about justice, but it doesn't follow through on it. And I think Plato is looking for a little bit more uh, penetrating self-reflection, critical self-reflection, but also to really look for, like, what is a stronger foundation on which to build a commitment to justice? So I, I kind of believe that um, there's, uh, like, okay, so, yeah, let, let me, I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. Okay, let's go back to this point about how Plato puts these arguments in the voice of Glaucon and Adamantus. Two young kids who are good, good hearted, right? They really believe in justice. They're just confused. They're like, I don't know what to do. They're very sympathetic characters. They're, they're smart kids. Um, and they, they believe in justice, but you, you almost have some sympathy for them when they're like, I'm just looking at the world and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? It looks like I have to live an unjust life. What else am I supposed to do? And for, for all of us who are maybe a little older and have some more experience with the world, we're like, yeah, man, I get, I've got like tons of sympathy for what you're dealing with because I had to deal with that too, right? I've confronted that. Um, and there's, I think Plato's trying to call up these intuitions of like, isn't justice really better? Like you really do think about this, but there's all these pragmatic constraints, practical concerns that cause you to compromise that where it's like, how are you going to make a, a happy life, right? How are you going to get that that good life? Um, so I like this point here that I think Plato thinks we can't bear, we have a hard time addressing this fact directly, of owning up to this. So by having these sympathetic characters kind of going through that same territory, that helps us to have a kind of transparent empathy with ourselves in confronting this sort of thing. 
by having compassion for them, we're able to kind of have compassion for ourselves and maybe look at something that's a little ugly that otherwise we might want to avoid taking a look at. Um, so I think that's another motive that Plato has in constructing things this way. And I want to throw this like last idea out. Um, I found that there's, uh, yeah, maybe I turn my hat for this one. Um, I've seen two strategies among humanity for trying to um, instill a strong moral character. And one of them, I think, is a path of dogmatism. And the other one is sort of a path of critical reasoning. So, um, and I, I clearly have a preference for one of these, but <laughs> everything you know from me this quarter. Um, but the strategy for dogmatism, I don't like, think is totally absurd. The idea of it is that if you don't think about it, if you don't ever question it, then there won't ever be any risk. You know, you won't be able to put those beliefs and values at risk. As soon as you start having the debate about it, or you're like, oh, should I have those values? Then maybe you give them up. That's why I said at the beginning of this unit, it's like, it's kind of dangerous to ask these questions, or some people have that feeling about it, of like, why should we even be asking the question, why be moral? Of course you should be moral. Stop asking that question. Only bad people think about that <laughs> kind of thing, right? Like a good person wouldn't even, wouldn't even think of it as an option, right? But I think that's pretty vulnerable. Um, it means that we don't really have a solid foundation on which we know why we're doing what we're doing. It just makes it kind of arbitrary, right? So as soon as these legitimate practical concerns rear their ugly head and those circumstances face us, then we're like, but this thing I know is good versus this thing I just sort of like take for granted as like something I'm supposed to do and not question. Well, then that's it's going to be really tempting to start compromising that stuff if you don't know why you've got those values. And that's where the second strategy comes in, the critical reasoning strategy. It's like, expose it, challenge it, let, let it face off against all these kinds of cynical concerns and objections, and figure out what are the arguments that actually would justify it, that really do prove that this is more valuable. And if you've got that understanding, if you've got that, say, wisdom, then you know why you're going to stay committed to those values, even when these other considerations come up to challenge it. You've already gone through that trial. You've already gone through that fire. And your commitment is tempered, like tempered steel or something, right? Um, it's not a surprise anymore. You're not like, oh, no, maybe I should. Uh, you know, you've already thought about it ahead of time. You're like, no, I, I wouldn't want to do it, and it's for these reasons, and, and that's why it's justified, right? And I think that's what Plato's trying to set up. Um, I've been doing a bunch of Plato in my 101 class, and uh, we've had a couple conversations about Plato scholarship. And I and I do I I kind of personally subscribe to this reading and interpretation of Plato, where he's less concerned about defending a particular type of philosophical thesis, and he's more concerned with the method of how we do philosophy. That most of his dialogues are a demonstration of argumentative techniques or argumentative attitudes. Um, ways in which people can be in relationship with each other in debate or disagreement or in truth seeking um, and all the dialogues are kind of showing different aspects of that there, there are some where he's got some like big ideas that he wants to justify but I think with when you're reading Plato it's not just about the arguments that are being explicitly thrown down it's also all about this drama that's contextualizing it that um, is like the how we get there sort of thing and so for my money Plato's thinking the relationship to have with justice and morality should be built on confronting these kinds of cynical views and cynical arguments. Um, okay, so, um, oh, and I forgot about this point. Yeah, this is in my lecture notes. Yeah, I, yeah, this, this is kind of connected with the point I was making about compassion, but I do think that Plato believes that there's a kind of tragedy of the world that he lives in and what kind of relationship it has with morality and we might still say the same thing today, too, um, by having it set up with these two young uh, kids that are, like, trying to confront this world that they're given to work with. Um, there is this kind of, of drama and potential tragedy of having those ideals and those, those higher values uh, thrown down. Okay. Um, I've got these questions at the end. A lot of the stuff we've already had kind of talked about. Um, you know, what do you think of these arguments? Where where would you place justice? That's kind of the conversation we had on Monday together. Um, and then this is the big question that I mentioned. Is morality opposed to happiness? That's kind of the way that this get this debate gets framed for Plato. Um, I mentioned that we're going to be moving into a different topic next week. 
this work by Schaefer Landau that's going to be all about reasoning and what counts as a good reason to do something. Um, and it's actually going to have a nice little bridge here with the discussion from Plato. Um, we're Because Schaefer Landau is also concerned about um, why would you be moral? What's the grounds for it? And thinking about how the reasons that you have for engaging in certain actions might constrain whether it's, there's even room to care about morality as something objective that you're accountable to, or whether it's all subjective and just a function of what you care about and what you want. So there's going to be kind of a return to relativism here. We're going to be, this, um, be back into the conversation about um, whether there is objective, universal moral truth at all. We'll get into that. But it's going to be kind of picking up another end of the stick in terms of the conversation we've been having. So if you take this why be moral question, you know, the way Plato's exploring it has a lot to do with considerations of happiness. Um, Schaefer Landau is going to be thinking about it in terms of rationality itself. Does rationality converge with morality or does it diverge? The same way that Plato's kind of in the Republic asking, does happiness converge with morality or does it diverge? So there'll be some similar things there. And uh, and I definitely wanted to get you this lecture because I didn't want to skip Plato for the sake of Schaefer-Landau um, because I think this is a good setup for following what Schaefer-Landau is going to be doing, which is much more complicated and sophisticated theoretically. Um, so good luck as you're working through that Schaefer-Landau reading. Um, and before I let you go here, I need to give you a code word. Um, I'm just looking around here. What's a good one? How about abyss? Abyss is the code word. And that's maybe uh, just aesthetically relevant for, for what we've been doing here today, um, looking into the abyss. So abyss is the code word uh, for the video. That's what I'll ask you to put in the quiz on Canvas. So why don't you do that? Um, oh, and just as a fun food for thought thing, like a little extra tangent. If you ever want to talk about this with me more, I'd, I'd love to. This is kind of picking up on Adamantus's contributions to this debate. This is an interesting question. If we're recognizing that society has this kind of role in impacting people's choices or setting a framework for it, what do you think is their job or you might say responsibility with respect to morality? Do you think it's society's responsibility to make it easy, attractive, like to give motivations for people to live moral lives or not? It's a very interesting debate that can be had around that. Um, Given that there is this kind of environmental effect, um, what should we be going for? And I think this is a really important question for today's world, of like where, where, what basket are we putting our hope eggs in? Um, where do we hope for change? And if you think back to all the moral theories we've studied over the course of the quarter, they would all give different answers to that too, I think, because of their different conceptions of what morality is. Okay, that's enough for this session. Thanks for watching this whole video, and I'm looking forward to um, talking with you next week with Schaefer Landau. Okay, bye.